Ta-da! It is now on. Okay. <clears throat> All right. I'm accustomed as I am to public speaking. Okay. Um, I'd like to um, go back and wrap up a few things uh, about what we've been doing in the course, and particularly on you know the sociological side of it. Uh, and um, I start with the, the idea of the sociological perspective, and then some background going back over the theory that we've looked at which uh, we didn't have a whole lot of time to do that at the beginning of the semester. I'd just like to insert some more of it back in here. Um, and because that's a perspective you're going to carry with you. And in a sense, that I'll come back to, you know, you need to help other people to be sociologists a little bit as well. Well, what do we mean by a sociological perspective? Well, C. Wright Mills, one of the famous sociologists, used to define it as, quote, a vivid awareness of the relationship between personal experience and wider society. In other words, we're not purely uh, independent individuals, uh, presupposition which is probably most widespread here in America, where we think of ourselves as primarily individuals. We issue from societies, family histories, social groups, and we reflect and refract the experience they have had and the meaning that they have drawn out from that experience, and perhaps modifying it ourselves. Uh, the problem is that most of that is invisible and so can be unconscious to us. Those kinds of values, structures, and, uh, and, and institutions. Uh, in most circumstances, we naturally are biased toward our own roots and nurturance, culture, without necessarily being that aware of it, and therefore blind to that of others. I think I told you the story when I was first a Peace Corps volunteer in Niger, and I'd been learning the Hausa language, and I was getting a little bit more fluent in it. And uh, so I went around town with my teacher, and we came across some Fulani people. That was a different people, and they were having their rites of passage for youth. And the youth get all dressed up men with, you know, lipstick and makeup, and, and go parading around, crowing, and people beat them over the, you know, the, the ribs with sticks. And they can't budge, you know, they ha ha ha, they go parading around. So I thought that was really interesting. So I asked my house of a different ethnic group counterpart, well, could you explain, well, what, why do they do this? What is this? And he said, they're Fulani, they're crazy. And that was his analysis of the situation. So that's sort of the typical analysis of a culture that you don't understand. It's opaque to you. Um, we, uh, in addition, we take the structures and habits that we have inherited to be themselves transcendent. We experience it. That's the way it is. That's, that's what it is. Uh, there's even a term you may remember here called reification in, uh, in sociology. Anyone know what reification means? What is re race in, in, in uh, R-E-S? Latin means thing. It means taking something that is simply an idea or something and making it into a, into a thing. Uh, it's a real solid thing. Okay. Um, the story, I don't know if I told you this one, that one of my own sociology teachers used to have as opposed to tell you that one, we're all stranded on a desert island and uh, can't get off, uh, and finally we realize we're stuck there, and so we're going to have to, uh, you know, get familiar with our surroundings and agree with each other what we're going to call things. Well, that over there is going to be uh, Ben Mountain, uh, and this is uh, Casey uh, River, and that's Kelvin Forest over there, and uh, this is uh, Sydney Swamp, sorry Sydney. This is uh, Sydney Swamp, I like that, okay. So at least we can talk to each other, we know I'm going there, you're going here. Okay, so we're there, we have kids. The kids grow up. By the time the kids grow up, it's not that some fine day we decided to name this Ben Mountain. No, it is Ben Mountain. That's right. No, it's clear that's Ben Mountain. That's a Ben Mountain. And ben Mountain looks like that. You know, and this is this is a Casey River. I mean, that's what a river is called. It's a Casey River. It's become a thing for them, so implanted in their own socialization. They don't perceive it as just something we made up one fine day in order to get around. It's reality itself. Okay. So uh, that's where we take the structures and habits we inherit to be transcendent and real in and of themselves. Uh, it therefore takes a real mental effort and or some good study to, as, um, as um, C.W. C. Mills put it, uh, think ourselves away from the patterns of thought, uh, valuation, and perspectives that are routine and semi-transcendental for us. And that's what sociology is about, thinking ourselves away so we can see something else, so that we can actually see this is just something that was put in place as a mind projection we've had onto this environment that is useful for us, but other people don't see it in the same way, and begin to be able to see the way in which they see it and distinguish it from our own. 
Uh, one good means for doing this, obviously, is to expose yourself to another culture. Uh, uh, and another is just to get to a place where you practice switching perspectives. You realize other perspectives and you can switch back and forth. Again, it reminds me of a story, first coming back from my years in Africa, the first time I came back after two and a half years, uh, it happened that I landed and met a friend in Times Square. Okay, and that's to just when they installed an uh, electronic uh, clock down to the hundredth of a second. Okay, it was you know, 9, 54, 36, over on this side. And we were like, wow. And we were saying to ourselves, what would that be in Niger, where we've been living for two and a half years? Well, it would probably be this big electric thing like that, electronic, that would say, early morning. Or would say, dusk. You know, the notion of a hundredth of a second was just uh, But one other thing I had is that when I got, I'd been back in the States a little while, I got used to everything again. I knew it. This was my country. And so, but there was a subtle difference, and that is my mind had flipped. I had been into a different thing. I had come back to this one, and though I was now back into it and very used to it, I was aware up here that, hey, that, the mind can flip. There isn't just one position for the mind. There are two or three. And that's the kind of, you know, thing that in sociology we nurture. Uh, okay, in fact, there are also different perspectives within sociology, and I think we visited that a little bit, and I want to go back over that because of its utility. Um, and, let's, and, and the ones I'd just like to go rapidly with you are functionalism, uh, conflict theory, and um, uh, uh, also uh, symbolic interactionism. So functionalism, can anyone give a 5 word or 10, 15 word definition of functionalism? What would characterize functionalism, Calvin? for you as a, a theory in sociology. You think of functionalism or anyone else have an identity identification? Like structural, systemic, like social yeah. meaning. It's often identified with, a, identified with a systems model. Actually, that's a little bit of a bad rap because there's more to it than that. In fact, if you want the Emil Durkheim, Talcott Parsons, the basic idea of functionalism is that society operates like a living organism. Society is a big living organism with many parts in it. And that means that uh, it, it naturally seeks stability and consensus and productivity. And it's always adjusting to, uh, you know, things that come down the road. Of course, there are dysfunctions, there's deviance, there are troubles and perturbations, but, you know, society adjusts to them and gets off and then goes forward on a new keel. So it's a big emphasis on the functional interrelated parts of society and how they operate together. Now one spin off that is your famous systems model, right? Input, process, output, inside a context, outcomes out here, that kind of thing. Yes, and that's a useful one, but that's really a caricature. This is a little bit more of it. Uh, to a considerable extent, it's a free market model. The idea is that individuals are interacting with themselves and they're going to find the right price and you know, they're going to organize things and they're going to get together in, in order to make it work. Um, uh, that the institutions are seen in this context as the collective means of uh, meeting individual and social needs. Uh, in fact, though it's something like a free market model, at least the sociologists out of the functionalist perspective put a little more understanding of institutions in than your typical neoclassical economists do. The problem with functionalism, one, is it doesn't handle social change very well. As a matter of fact, Antonio Gramsci, who is a famous sociologist from more of a radical conflict perspective, uh, once said that the problem is it contributes to the status quo and reinforces cultural hegemony. What does cultural hegemony mean? Anyone know that, that term? Similar. Everyone follows the same stuff. Pardon? Is that everyone follows the same ideas, beliefs? Yeah, cultural hegemony is some culture is the, sort of the top dog culture and it's the standard of what the way you ought to talk and the way you ought to be. And so one way that a dominant group controls other groups is that their culture becomes the ruling culture, and you've got to match the norms of that culture. So that's the idea of cultural hegemony. So he's criticizing it by saying it reinforces cultural hegemony. Well, let's go, and, and the, the, uh, the, the functional theory kind of mixes max, micro and macro. It has a little bit both sides. Now, the conflict theory, perhaps you know that, that's Marx, uh, C. Wright Mills, uh, Bulls and Gators, people like that, Gramsci, uh, it's more of a macro theory. How would you sum up? Well, it's coming from Marx, right? Mm -hmm. So Marx basically, the, the idea is here is there are historically inbuilt uh, differences in power in society, and they are going to, they're, they're there, and you've got to deal with them. Uh, for Marx, it was labor and capital, you know, it was an economic opposition. For Gramsci, it was culture, high culture and low culture. 
for people like C. Wright Mills, it was those who have social capital and those who don't, connections, not connections, stuff like that. But in any case, there's opposition. There's conflict between these groups. Um, and a matter of fact, uh, in uh, opposition to the functionalist idea of consensus, what the conflict people would say, the only place you get consensus is when a group of people with similar interests get together. And therefore, you're going to have different groups. They're going to be in opposition to each other. Yeah, these people are going to be in consensus. Those people are going to have consensus. These people are going to have consensus. But you ain't going to have society-wide con consensus. There are differences in interest, differences in uh, stake, and in operation. Uh, and of course, what traditionally conflict theorists, and we've heard had a lot of that come into what we've looked at, uh, the, the differences they look at are those in race, class, and gender. But more recently, that's expanded. Now we do differences in sexual orientation, disability, ability, and things like that can also enter in. But you're basically saying there are different groups with fundamentally different interests here. You can't call it just one big happy circle that is society, okay? Uh, there's a famous saying by Anatole France, of France, a French uh, uh, writer. Uh, the law, in all its majestic quality, forbids the wealthy as well as the poor from sleeping under the bridges, from begging in the streets, and from stealing bread. He's saying this is our idea of equality. We do make no difference. The wealthy people, you cannot sleep under the bridge. Poor people, you cannot sleep under the bridge. Back and forth like that. So. It, it basically, it's an ironic way of saying the laws seem to be equal, but they aren't equal in their impact. Because, of course, it's the only the poor that need to sleep under the bridge. Or uh, anybody know, um, uh, what's his name, the famous folk, Woody Guthrie. That name, it, it, he was a folk singer from uh, Oklahoma. Uh, there's a wonderful song he has, you can look it up on YouTube, Peter Pretty Boy Floyd, which was about a famous gangster and populist gangster sort of in the Depression era that used to give money to the poor that he robbed from the banks, right? But so he does this song, listen to it sometime on YouTube, but at the very end of it, the verse goes, um, as around this world I've uh, traveled, I've met many funny men. Some will rob you with a six gun, some with a fountain pen. Okay, so it's the idea of keeping the fact that as much robbery is going on from the centers of power as is going on uh, from the gangsters. Well, that's a sort of a taste of conflict theory. It's looking and centering itself on those conflicts between groups with different interests and the dominance of some over others and what the others do to try to become aware of it. Then the third is symbolic interactionism. Uh, George, uh, Herbert Mead, or Herbert Bloomer, and, and, and people like that. As a matter of fact, I have a thing here that I want to uh, demonstrate, and I'll go there for like dot cam, like that. I'll turn this on. Did I do that right? Yes, it's coming warming up. Um, here are, in symbolic interactions is more, um, you know, basically a micro theory about small scale, uh, Dr. Uh, Lara Perez Feltner was talking about this a little bit, interactions among people and the way those build up into patterns of society. Uh, so let's see here, I'll go like this, like that, and we'll project this. Here it is, uh, Bloomer's uh, Three Principles of Symbolic Interactions. Number one, humans act toward things on the basis of the meanings they ascribe to those things. The meanings of such things is derived from or arises out of social interaction that one has with others in society. These meanings are handled in and modified through an interpretive process used by the person dealing with these things he or she encounters. So what they're basically saying is the meaning of anything is, uh, is what we ascribe to it. It doesn't exist with that thing itself. We decide what the meaning is. Reality lies in our social projections on the things. It isn't out there in the world. That ain't nothing until we interpret it. So they're basically saying human life is lived in the symbolic domain. Uh, language is the way in which we establish what the symbolism is, good, symbolism is going to be and the meaning is going to be. Just like that example from the desert island, we have to come up with ways to refer to things in order to be able to deal with each other, and then that creates a structure of meaning. Um, reality is therefore a social product, um, and you can think of that in college. What a college is is what people come thinking it is to a very large extent. There's an image of what academe is supposed to be. There's an image of what university is supposed to be that's embedded in a culture and embedded in people's heads. 
And that determines the reality of it more than necessarily the buildings or, or, or the other things that go on. Uh, and uh, it, this, this meaning must be arrived at through interaction with other people, uh, uh, negotiation about what we're going to mean by this, and even role taking. You start to play roles with respect to some institution or some activity, and that defines what it means. Um, so, uh, and even self-concept formation is formed in the same way. There's an emphasis, therefore, in this tradition on socialization, uh, how people are brought into that domain of meaning, and, uh, uh, but it, 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 it's a process for, a, if you will, explaining social reproduction. Uh, kids have to learn that meaning, just like those kids in the desert island had to learn what we name these things, and that builds up into meanings that accrete and become the reality. And uh, that's how something that uh, was a reality now may get projected to the next generation, as we call social reproduction, people coming up in the same place that their parents were, and it's through that mechanism. Okay, well, um, it, basically those three perspectives are ones to keep in mind. They are competing perspectives, but I think from a practitioner's point of view, they're complementary ones. There's some of that in anything. And those become tools for looking at it. What's the conflict going on here? You may remember the key question in conflict uh, theorists is, qui bono? Who benefits? Who loses? That's where you begin to discover what the heck the conflict is that's going on. Uh, there are ways in which universities and societies operate like systems, like organisms, that interact and adjust, and that's a useful way of looking at it too. And a lot of this is rooted at the personal level in this kind of symbolic interactionism the way people learn to name things and the meanings that they project onto them, why it's so important to get down to that. So I think all those, those are useful. Um, and for uh, sociological theory, therefore, gives us some templates to use in understanding the processes we're dealing with in universities and elsewhere. Uh, student affairs and higher education also have a, uh, a, their own routines and their own patterns that one must to think oneself away from at times, they also begin to become a template that is imposed on our consciousness. So that exercise of getting out and seeing different ways of doing it is very valuable in that domain. Uh, switching perspectives is a good exercise, looking at things from different viewpoints um, and uh, avoiding reification uh, and uh, seeing it from the inside and from the outside. These are all things that hopefully sociology helps us to practice. Because it's reminding us of the whole time that what this means has been built by us and can be unbuilt by us and is seen differently by people who are coming from different backgrounds. And we've got to learn to distinguish the different ways in which people see it. You may remember the House of Proverb that I shared with you, which just means whatever caused the mouse to run into the fire has got to be hotter than fire itself. So the things underneath that are driving action, that's what sociology is teaching us to be sensitive to, to inquire into and to understand because out of them come different perspectives and it's different perspectives that make a difference in how things are seen and experienced. Okay, uh, in any case, um, uh, well, I encourage you, I'm uh, really, look, well, I, I wish you all kinds of success going forward. Uh, you've got a very important role uh, because the university is one of the key places uh, in years to come as it has been in years past. And if we're going to survive another generation yet, it's going to be because we're able to deal with conflict, we're able to deal with systems, we're able to deal with symbolic interaction and discern them. We can see behind the, the evident uh, surface. One of the other key methods, or excuse me, mottos in sociology, Peter Berger uh, once put it very sim simply, the first uh, wisdom of sociology is that things are not what they seem. So getting used to seeing what is invisible, hopefully this uh, semester has helped you with that. And hey, did I get done in time? Well, no, I went over a little bit. I'm sorry. But there you go. Y'all have a good one. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. Um, let me turn this gizmo off.